Beast Machines episode reviews continue now with Revelations Part 3, Apocalypse. Spoiler alert, this episode does not feature any apocalypse. I think the Marvel villain would be a closer thing to appear in this than an actual apocalypse. Uh, also, typically ep apocalypses are not uh, are not really brought up at like episode nine out of a 26 episode series, just saying. So the episode starts off with, uh, we're, we're following up on everything previously. So, uh, we were trying to, you know, like the Cheetor and Rhinox are trying to jack into Rhinox and try and restore his original persona. At this time, they don't know that it's Rhinox. We're going to find that out uh, finally in this episode. Um, uh, but they're trying, but the second they find out, the second Rat Trap finds out that like, well, okay, no, no, I, I stand corrected. They do know it's Rhinox. They just found that out at the end of last episode, but as soon as, soon as they figure that out, they just kind of stop. Like Rat Trap just kind of stops working on, uh, uh, tank or with his tail and then just kind of like talk it over. Um, they get a little bit out of Tankor, where he actually does start recognizing Cheetor and Rat Trap. So that's there, but Tankor's programming takes over again. We go through a whole chase sequence between them and the tank drones. They blow up a lot of Cybertronian architecture along the way. Um, th I mean, th that's really all that is. Um, Cheetor and... Rat Trap had something really good in episode two, but episode three just seems like uh, they're just stalling at this point. Like um, where it feels like the natural conclusion is to continue on and get to like Rhinox as Tankor. Uh, we don't get to that and we don't accomplish that. Uh, we have to wait and we have to stall until all the plots come together. I kind of understand why, but at the same time, it feels like it could have been handled cleaner than that. Um, let's see, uh, on the opposite side of things, uh, Primal is still going on his uh, spiritual trips. The, the Oracle is putting his own fears and doubts in front of him, and it's just the Maximals constantly saying how much Primal has failed. In this case, uh, they appear as uh, living plants of their heads, uh, which is really creepy. <laughs> so it's just a rat head sticking out of a vine. It's, these things are a little bit odd. They're just, these, these head trips are just a little bit odd if you hadn't been following or paying attention. Um, he's still not getting answers. He's asking the Oracle literally, like, I don't doubt the wisdom, but please be more clear. And then the Oracle just gets more vague, <laughs> which is what, like, which is what, like, omnipotent beings do when they're communicating with lower creatures, right? They're just super vague about everything instead of just going, like, just go there, do that. And it's never that easy. It's never that easy. Uh, the third part of this plot that we're picking up from last episode is the fact that Black Arachnia just had her spark extracted by Jetstorm, which leads to a aerial battle between Night Scream and Jetstorm, and it should, should be a really cool battle. Uh, it's not. Uh, this is mostly just Night Scream tricking Jetstorm into Home Alone traps uh, and basically making him look like a clown. And then that cause, and uh, because now he has possession of uh, Black Arachnia's spark, that causes him to run into Thrust, who is taking Black Arachnia's body off. Um, and that leads to a fight with them that also ends very abruptly because uh, Night Scream's little, like, vampire trick is a little bit overpowered uh, in a one-on-one -on -one fight. I question, like... When people describe Night Scream as a Mary Sue style character, I kind of go, well, it's not that bad. But then I remember how easily he got to transform after he became uh, reformatted. And then I remember scenes like this, where he took out two of the Viacon generals solo by himself. Uh, yeah. And very easily, by the way. Very easily. Um, but no, no, like... 
It's a, 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 yeah, I, can, I can see it. I can absolutely see it where he's written to be just a little bit too good at what he's doing. Um, so yeah, I, I get it now. I get it. Uh, but in the process of this, we actually do get an out-of-body experience for Black Arachnia for once. Uh, so uh, she gets to talk to Primal in like spiritual space. Um, we, we now know that the Matrix is a thing that connects all Transformers, which kind of brings the whole Till All Are One thing a apart because we're all already one. Uh, so we're going to ditch that little bit of the mythos for this series. Not that they read up on the mythos, but you know. Uh, the other weird part about this whole scene is the fact that once Black Arachnia Spark is recovered, Night Scream doesn't know how to get it to go back in her body, so it just kind of flies off. And, okay, so, I really don't like how this series treats Sparks. Because it's their heart, it's the soul of the Transformer. It really shouldn't be this thing that can survive outside of a Spark chamber. Otherwise, in... Beast Wars, when Optimus Primal's spark is, uh, or like when Optimus Prime is dying at the at the at the, in like in optimal situation, uh, when Prime Prime is dying, his body his spark needs to be transferred to another body in order to survive. Why, if you can just put it in a jar, why, like like, what's the point? What's the point of the spark chamber if it's not like keeping the spark going if it's not containing the spark the only spark we saw behaving like this previously was star screams and star scream spark is immortal like it there's like a literal like story element to that that draws all the way from g1 in order to explain why that spark can bounce around all over the place but the others in the entirety of beast wars were confined strictly to their little home Otherwise, how does Rampage's spark get split the way it does to make Dinobot 2? See, see, this is why you have to watch a series before you write a sequel to it, because these are the plot gaps you come up with. So yeah, I, I hate the idea that sparks are just like, they don't need, they don't have to, they don't need to be, to stay in a body to survive. They can just fly around on their own willy-nilly. I hate that, I hate that aspect. I hate that. So... Uh, yeah, so let's see. Uh, one of the notes I wrote down here, we basically stretched the same premise out for three episodes, pushing the same trick over and over of just trying to talk to the original personalities out of their new programming, which, yeah, that is kind of the theme of this entire trilogy. Uh, whether it's, you know, talking to Thrust or talking to Tank, or it's literally just them just trying to talk the old personalities out of them. And it really didn't need to go three episodes, I think. I, I think this is stretching out the concept a, l a little bit too far, especially when you have filler things like, you know, Cheetor and Rat Trap having to, you know, getting through, getting through Tankor, but then having to go through, the, but then having all reset, battle with tank drones, etc., just to get back to the same point they were at. Uh, Black Arachnia's spark being grabbed for an ep for part of the episode. This really does feel like it could have been truncated into a two-parter, and I don't think you really would have missed anything. Um, of course, the big thing in this episode, like the massive thing in this episode is the fact that we find, you know, Rhinox isn't who he used to be. So we first find this out in spiritual space. Now, to be fair, when Tankor first starts talking to Cheetor and Rat Trap and starts remembering them, it does seem like he's, you know, it, does, it seems like everything's on the up and up. But then we get to the this scene right here, actually, where uh, Primal's talking directly to Rhinox in the Matrix, and Rhinox is not him. He is far darker. He actually believes in Megatron's technological future. Um, it, 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 he's gone complete and total villain. So here's the thing. When you're dealing with the character changes in this, you can talk about character assassination. You really can. But when you look at the characters, we look at Primal, who's gone, through, who's now more spiritual. It's because he had this direct encounter with the Oracle. He had a religious experience. When you talk about Black Arachnia losing her uh, femme fatale style, uh, you're talking about her own desperation to get Silverbolt back, kind of making that a moot point. Uh, so she's very much just toned down a lot. We talk about Rat Trap and becoming the, uh, the, the, the tech head of the team. 
it is because his disability prevents him from being what he used to be on the team. So now he's finding new ways of being useful and uh, being more resourceful. Uh, so all of them kind of have some kind of logic going through what their character is now, but it all does feel very forced and none of it feels really natural, but you can see where they were trying to make the transition. With Rhinox, it literally just comes completely out of the blue. There is no build up to this. There is no kind of hint that Rhinox was ever going to turn out like this. And Rhinox is the last person. Rhinox was the one who wanted to sit in the back smelling flowers, who didn't want the leadership role. And now he's the megalomaniac who wants to take over Cybertron from Megatron and the Maximals. It's... This is character assassination. Now, if you explain it of like, well, this whole being a Viacon has corrupted your spark. Well, number one, we see that's not really true when we get to like talk to the sparks of the other generals later on. Uh, but you also have to like look at this scene thinking yourself like maybe maybe his spark is just corrupted. But we I, I had to go back. So spoiler alert, I try to keep it all in one ep within episode, but I have to go forward for this. No, he talks to Primal after he dies uh, and just admits like he was misguided. At no point does he say a spark was purified. Maybe that's slightly alluded to, but really not, really not. Uh, it, just real, it just kind of feels like he knows he made a mistake rather than, uh, rather than like, oh, well, Megatron corrupted his spark. And, and of course, when we get Silverbolt back, we see that also wasn't true. Like, the experience definitely changes them emotionally, mentally, but he doesn't get corrupted by it. So, yeah. Uh, Rhinox is really uncomfortable in this episode. And it, part of it also comes down to a very rare uh, directing error from Sue Blue, who's one of the best in the business, by the way. Um, uh, the... Uh, the scene between him and Primal was supposed to be much more somber, but because of how it read, uh, uh, Rhinox came off far more aggressive, far more villainous, uh, to the point where he sounds like really angry and hostile, even when he's talking to Cheetor and Rat Trap, before he starts spouting off about technological perfection. So, like, e like even that scene, just like it, the tone feels off. Uh, because, because of, because of that, it just feels weird. Uh, so yeah, so here's your conclusion to revelations. Um, overall, this episode is passable. I think for beast machines, uh, the first two episodes were better written and I could follow them better. Episode three just feels like it's spinning its wheels a lot. It feels like most of the scenes are completely unnecessary or just there to waste time. And then Rhinox's heel turn is literally out of nowhere. It's like a real professional wrestling heel turn where you just get smacked with a steel chair out of nowhere and it's done for shock value. And I hate shock value storytelling. And that is exactly what Rhinox is in this one. Uh, so that's all I got. Thank you guys for watching. This is, uh, yeah... This is one of those. This is one of those things that makes it feel like, yeah, this is one of the bad shows, isn't it? But uh, yeah, I, I think uh, it is somewhere between like passable and skippable quality. Like, you, like you can't skip anything because it's all story. But you know, first just quality episode, it ain't this one. So tune in tomorrow. We'll see if we get any better from here. Uh, it's the boson's turn. <laughs> he's looking at TJ's character and he's just like. What you gonna do? Right. I blow him a kiss. <laughs> I love him. <laughs> I love him. What's your problem? He's just gonna pull his can crossbow and just fire at you. That's fair at this point. <laughs> <laughs>